What's happening, what's happening, what's happening? Of course, you know it's your boy, Beehive Radio, shout in. Stepping in the building, I got an A-Town legend in this thing that's responsible for a lot of stuff that you might not even understood or even knew that he was behind. I'm talking about BME. I'm talking about A-list artists from A to Z. He represents them. I slick want to call him the Atlanta Johnny Cochran in this thing. Woo. Vince Phillips, what's good with it, boss? <laughs> hey, what's going on, my brother? Man, feeling good, <laughs> feeling great. Now, I yeah. mean, first of all, Vince... Okay. Can you tell me what was it that made you get into law? Into law? Mm hmm Okay, so um, so I was going to Georgia State University, mm -hmm. right, back in the day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and to be honest, n near my senior year, my best friend got killed. Damn. Right? Actually, in my junior year. And, and, it, and initially, it kind of just threw, it just derailed my whole life, you know. Everybody knew Julio. Julio was my yeah. boy. His brother, Chico's. Still my boy to this day. You still mm -hmm. see me running around with him. So when um, when when Julio got killed, I just kind of had went into I, I went into a criminal justice major, right? Mm. So I changed my major, criminal justice, and I'm doing that. And by the time I get through senior year, um, you know, I'm looking to the other people around me. I'm like, well, what, what you know, what you trying to do with this major? And they're like, I'm trying to be a DEA. Mm. Oh, oh. Oh, wow. You know, what you, what you trying to do? Man, I, I want to be an FBI. Oh. Man, you know what? I, you know what? I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be any of those things. Yeah. So around that same time, the music was just starting to take off in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were a street team back then. The B&B mm -hmm. was really, back then, was black market entertainment. Yeah. And we was just black market. And we used to pass out flyers and CDs for clubs and for labels, right? So myself, my partner Rob... You know, we were the main guys who did the, the marketing, mm -hmm. uh, working the records. And then our other partner, Cersei and Lil John, they would be the DJs, help make sure the records played. Yeah. So we were getting accounts with different labels to do street team and try to blow up songs in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but now we, we, I just saw Jermaine Dupri suddenly like take off with his group, Crisscross. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, well, what, what, you know, what is he doing? What's that, you know? Yeah. And then I'm seeing, you know, Dallas Austin, and, and he had an artist starting to take off. So so I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be a cop or a DEA, so I'm, but, but I, I'm going to go ahead and go to law school mm -hmm. because the people that I'm seeing, I'm seeing this business starting to become something right in front of me. It's brand new. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of it in Atlanta yet, but, you know, if, if I can – I'm already kind of doing the business for my friends, right? Yeah. I'm trying to make sure Lil John get paid, make sure that, you know, the people around Cersei getting paid. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm already kind of business minded, mm -hmm. but we college age, you yeah. know, just like everybody out here today, young college guys trying to get on and, exactly. and figure it out, you know? And so I said, I'm going to go to law school. And then if the music thing doesn't work, I still be a lawyer. Exactly. Right. I've been. How your mama used to say, "Have something to fall back." Come on, on man. I say, well, if the music don't take off, I'll be a lawyer, and then I could just, you know, figure out, you know, what kind of law I want to do. Exactly. So that's how it, that's how it started. Linking up with John and Cersei early on. I mean, how did all of y'all guys come together? Oh, it's crazy. So we we actually met in eighth grade. Oh Lord. Yeah, we met at South. That's the name of our publishing company, Eighth Grade Music Publishing. What? Me, Lil John. Emperor Cersei and Rob, we met on the track in the PE class in the eighth grade. We was the whole group that was trying to not really actually work out. <laughs> so, you know, we did this thing where we both were like, we, were like, we move our arms like this, but we really just walk slow. Exactly. We look like we trying to do something. Yeah. And so we just, uh, we all just kind of had bonded, yeah. you know, really being silly, yeah. you know, uh, and, and uh, we all got to know each other. And the thing was, you know, Southwest Middle School, which is now called Gene Child Young. You know, I went there too, Vince. I understand. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. I was and you the, went to Maze? I went to Maze. You, you know the cluster. Yes, sir. I thought you was from the cluster. <laughs> you know, Maze High Raiders, man. Y'all exactly. see what happens with these Maze High Raiders. Big like, old facts we right there. We something special, man. We yes, something sir. special in this town. So so I went to, you know, we was at Southwest. Yeah. And, um, and, and you know, Southwest, you know, everybody was Ralph Lauren down. Yeah. You know, they were kind of fly. Fashion so show. Cersei, he was coming from Bankhead. He used to have a silver tooth in his mouth. He didn't really <laughs> have the whole Southwest Atlanta thing going. Yeah. John, even though his parents had some money, they they didn't they never would let him dress like that. So he never had the, uh, <laughs> the he polos. never had the, the right polo or even yeah. the eyes. Or he had that tiger. You remember? <laughs> you remember the jumping tiger? He had the jumping tiger show. 
<laughs> you know, I, and I, I, I had lived in South Carolina. My mom moved me out of Atlanta when I was 10. I lived mm. in South Carolina from 10 to 14. Yeah. So I came back, and I'm just looking like old country country boy. <laughs> so we was also dudes that didn't quite fit, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But we, we all clicked up. Exactly. And then we started throwing parties. Really, the first party we ever threw was in Lil' John Mama basement in the eighth grade. My God. In the eighth grade, yeah. So with y'all being able to grow up together and then form BME together, what yeah. was that like when you started to see that label start to take off, man? You know, it's funny. People used to be like, you know, how'd you feel when it took off? But, you know, it must be kind of like that thing they call the secret because we already felt like we was big. Damn. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, really, I didn't know the difference because it felt like we was already that. Yeah. You know? And you got to think, all right, so we threw our first party in the eighth grade. I mean, that one didn't do that great. But by the time we was, by the time we got to like 11th grade throwing yeah. these parties, they was the biggest parties in Atlanta. Like, they was the craziest high school parties, period, yeah. to this day. Anybody who watched this that lived in Atlanta back then would be like, I remember them parties off Flamingo Drive. You remember <laughs> those parties off Flamingo Drive, yeah. right? And there would be so many cars and so many people, and it would be like, Cause we we used to venture out by mm -hmm. then, cause we was, we were skateboarders too. Okay, right. We was into other cultures. Mm -hmm. We hung around college people. Mm -hmm. So in the eleventh grade, we had a party where, you know, our hood friends came, our maze high friends came, our Doug friends came, because John went to Doug. Okay. And then we also had college people. We had skateboarders, white kids, and so it was like a crazy mix going yeah. on. Uh, and and so by the time. It continued on through the years past that, past college, and we started to really put out music. Yeah. It all just felt like us still doing the same thing we ever did. It just was more and more people was paying attention to it. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So you can't really tell. Now you, you going tell. in the law though, Vince. Yeah. How do you feel like that played a part in the success of everything that was going on? Because by you saying, you know what, I'm gonna go and get this law degree and understand this paperwork right. and the business side of yeah. it. How do you think that played a role into BME? I mean, you know, BME was a was like a transformer machine. Like, you, you know, you had Lil John and Cersei DJing. You had Rob doing the management, mm -hmm. me doing law. Cersei also working at the radio station, yeah. getting hurt, mm -hmm. right? But for <laughs> me, you know, but to have a lawyer in the crew, yeah. uh, someone who can really do business, is a great thing because not only was I able to protect the company, mm -hmm. protect the team, make sure the paperwork was right, yeah. But also as an attorney, I I was working with other people, so. Like I was Young Jeezy's first attorney. I did. I created CTE back then. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right? cold blooded, Vince. Right? You gonna drop that on me? Come no, on with real. it. So I mean, yeah. so now if you go back now and look at that first, first Young Jeezy Hard and Stars pro, Hard and yeah. Soft project, you'll see featuring Lil John, China White, Bo Hagen, mm -hmm. and Bone Crusher. Yeah. You wonder why? Because I was, I was like, hey y'all, I got a client named Jeezy. And he, you know, he's spending some money over there, and yeah. he, you know, John, you need some beats, so you know. And then same thing happened when I had Young Bloods. I was representing Young Bloods. Yeah, Young Bloods. You know, they had Pretty Ken and the Attic Crew killing the production. Yeah. But then when they wanted, like, you know, grab some of that crunk sound, I had John go over there. You yeah. Know? John, I was the the in between. You yeah. Know? And then we even had a little baseball team back then called <laughs> ABC Attic Crew Black Market <laughs> Collaboration. Yeah. So we used to have, you know, we used to always hang with Attic Crew heavy. But being a lawyer was able to be a, a, a middle between our company and our celebrities and other celebrities. Seeing a young, young Jeezy helping him set up that label, what was that like? And what are these artists like when you catch them young? Because, see, you go from young Jeezy, but now you're dealing with NBA young boy at the same time, right, too. Right, right. So what is it like getting these young men organized? You know, it's crazy because, okay, so back then I was damn near the same age as my clients, right? Mm. You know what I mean? I was a little older, like I'm older than young bloods. Yeah. Older than Jeezy, but not a whole lot older. So, yeah. like, back then I could do contracts with them, do work with them, and then go grab a drink and hang out with them afterwards. <laughs> exactly. Don't so much do that now. And I don't even know if these young ones even know how cool I am. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but that's okay. I, I, <laughs> it's, it's sooner or later, you just got to be the lawyer. Just be the lawyer, you know. But, but you know, but I try to be uh, a person that brings a, a extra kind of guidance, yeah. you know, uh, because, you know, first of all, people come to the lawyer for guidance anyway. Mm -hmm. And to succeed does require your business to be right and your paperwork to be right, mm -hmm. but it also requires you to be right. Mm -hmm. 
you know, your work ethic to be right. Your, you, you know, your personal business, not the business that we got done on the paperwork, but you as a as an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm looking at the you got the little baby plaque up there. I remember one of the you know we do we do uh, Wolfpack and through Wolfpack we we got you know we represent little baby. Yeah. Rennie Rucci and uh, Mad Mark, you yeah. know, in Highland, yeah, through through uh, Wolfpack, and I remember one of the first meetings we had that little baby might have been late to a show or something, and Coach and Big and those guys they kind of were jumping on him, and his answer, I knew I knew then I said, oh this boy something because he said, oh no I I I didn't I wasn't trying to be late I hit some bad bad traffic and I I believed him, mm -hmm. you know he's like I'm not in this business to be late for anything I'm trying to be on time or early exactly and. And he said it with such passion, whereas I noticed a lot of artists, you know, why was you late? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, when you when you see the work ethic, you know, or when you don't see the work ethic, mm. you want to try to give that advice. Yeah. You know? But I say this, Jeezy, you know, some people you could just tell they was meant to they were gonna do it. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeezy had that grind, that work ethic. You know, him and Shardy Red was doing those tracks at the time. Mm -hmm. The Shardy Red sound with yes, Jeezy was uh, incredible. Ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, uh, and, and he had, you know, and he had uh, he had some some street personalities with him that I knew he had to finance. That's right. You know what That's I'm saying? That's right. So, you know, he, I, I was like, yeah, this guy, he can win. You know, sometimes you look at it, you're like, he can win. Yeah. Fast forward all these years later, you know, young boy, I saw how he grind, how much music he made, mm -hmm. how much he jumps into getting his videos done. Like, it's unbelievable, to be honest, how many songs Youngboy makes yeah. in a week. And us usually he'll come out of that and make two or three videos mm. immediately. So, you know, he got, you know, he does his things that causes him issues, Yeah, you know? But at the same time, I gotta say, like the work ethic side is hard to beat. When it comes to helping these artists navigate endorsements and just different deals and yeah. stuff like that, how do you go about brokering that kind of stuff? So, you know, um, a lot of artists have different, uh, you know, have they, their brand stands for something different. Mm -hmm. So the first thing really is to try to make sure that the artist is being matched with the proper brand. That's right. Right. I got, I got a thing I say now, I feel like it's multiple mainstreams, mm -hmm. right? It used to be, you know, used to be skateboarding wasn't mainstream. Skateboarding yeah. was a counterculture that was like, you know, you get grabbed by the police just for skateboarding <laughs> in the city, yeah. right? So, you know, these yeah. kind of things were like small culture before. Now, everything is a big culture, mm -hmm. right? So now things that used, to, marijuana used to be, you know, under, keep it low, yeah. and uh, now that's big mainstream culture. Yeah. So artists, you know, you look at what, who an artist is and you, and you try to make sure that the artist matches themselves up with a brand that really matches. So if they, if they, you know, John was a drinker. Mm -hmm. You know, we, let's go back to the first branding that we ever did, Crunk Energy Drink. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so if you go back, you know, we, we was lucky enough and blessed enough to be on the uh, Grey Goose tour. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's because Sidney Frank, who owned Grey Goose, he, he, had, he couldn't figure out why black people suddenly started buying Grey Goose, but he was happy about it. Yeah. And then somebody told him that a group called 8 Ball MJG Mm -hmm. Had a line in the song. They said, "Give me that gray goose." Now put that yak back, right? Mm. You remember that line? I recall in the song? that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and he Stop was playing games, right? Right. Yeah. Playing games. Yeah. So this man was smart. This old white man was a smart man. He said, "Let me meet that rap group." And then he said, "I want to fund a tour." And then just by the grace of God, that group said, "Well, let's add Lil John and the Eastside Boys on the tour." You know, what? with us. You know, just to open up for us or whatever. Eight Ball and JG was bigger at that time. Yeah. Oh, you know, they might have been around the same, but but it was their opportunity and they, they brought us in on it. But the, the company ended up falling in love with our company because, mm. you know, number one, John is selling a party. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's his concept. He's selling a party. Exactly. He's selling getting drunk yeah. for the most part. You know, so, you know, the other artists might perform and be like, all right, Houston, good night. And, but John would be like, I got this great goose. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're going to get drunk right now. So they were like, Man, we love you guys. Exactly. You know, and so so the brand, like we just talked about, it matched up. But 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 instead of doing a liquor, we did an energy drink because John was selling energy. Crunk. Crunk juice, right? Yeah. Crunk energy drink. And, and and it's actually still on shelves to this day. You might have to look. Yeah. You might have to go find it. You might have to go to the hood. <laughs> but you can still find Crunk Energy Drink. And that was in 2003. So... This, for it to still be around to this day is really 
quite amazing. It's going on 20 years that Crunk Energy Drink has been available. Vince, coming out of the west side of Atlanta with it, okay? Yeah. Starting that business up with the fam. What was it like when you started seeing the money coming in and as the lawyer of the group being responsible of understanding and negotiating this shit? I mean, it was beautiful, Woo! to be honest. It was it was the validation mm -hmm. of the part that I said that we already knew. Yeah. So it's like you already know you're there. Mm. And the good thing that I always could say, especially about John, John doesn't John never really did it for the money. Mm. Right? So so we almost had to make sure John got paid. Because John would DJ. He was, you know, in the days of loading up your car with a, a long table mm -hmm. and turntables and bringing vinyl and a couple of your friends helping you carry the vinyl. Yeah. All that work. And bringing some speakers to yeah. do a backyard party for somebody. Yeah. And setting all that up. He would do it just because he loved doing it. My God. So if we weren't like, hold on, let's hey, hey, get some money for John, man. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, but that kind of was the almost what, what probably propelled him because when people are doing what they love, like they always say, when somebody is doing what they love, the rest is going to come. Mm -hmm. So fast forward years later, the money starts coming in, and it was like, this is truly validated now. Mm -hmm. You know, our hard work is paying off. But now, yes, you have to keep an eye on things. You have to watch. You have to know what to be ex what, what to expect at what time, mm -hmm. right? You got to look and make sure you're meeting all the different uh, goals that reach that might give you a bonus payment and things of that nature. Yeah, you know, um, um, and, and also, you know, you want to make sure that when when it's in the account, that you got proper people managing it, mm. right? So that's a whole another business, and we, you know, found a good. Uh, a business management team that really was amazing on making sure that we did the right things. And we, you know, we bought a studio. Yeah. Now we could save more money, mm -hmm. right? Because then once we own the studio, exactly. now we can record projects in the studio. Yeah. Uh, and so those things were all beneficial. So now y'all got BME going crazy, and then you starting to come across these new artists. How did y'all go about figuring out who y'all were going to sign to the label and then just scaling? So... You know, for the most part, no lie, I, I did a lot of the signing. Okay. You know, I did the signing. Because to be honest, John is a perfectionist. Yeah. John <laughs> was more like nothing ever was really good enough to John. And there's, there's no disrespect to anybody. That's just how John is and his, his, how, he's, yeah. how his brain works. But I knew that the, the Crunk movement and the BME movement was never going to be huge if we didn't sign some more acts. Ooh. So... To yeah. be honest, what I did was I'll wait till John go on the road. <laughs> and he going out to see. And then uh, uh, the way, it, the, uh, and then Trillville was the first act that we signed outside of the first batch. So initially it was Lil John, the East Side Boys, China White, mm -hmm. out of New Orleans, Six Shot, Bo Hagen. Bo Hagen been with us since the beginning. I'm talking the 90s. Yeah. Right? And Don Ute. Mm -hmm. They were called Full Time Family. It was a super group. Yeah. We never got a chance to put nothing out on Full Time Family, Damn. but they were like amazing. And for the most part, John had put that whole group together. I think I found Six Shot. Six Shot was the only person I brought into that. Everybody else, John had brought in. So that was an era, but, but we couldn't, you know, China ended up going to, going to prison. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when John and the East Side Boys started taking off, we had to just concentrate on John and the East Side Boys more for a while yeah. so we could get them all the way up before we could even try to bring out more groups. Yeah. Right? So meanwhile now, this crunk thing is happening. And, like, Bohagen not, not, wasn't crunk. Bohagen's a rapper. Yeah, he's, he's a, a rapper. lyricist. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, and we had the lyrical giants, Bone Crusher, Bazaar, and Baby B. Right? Yeah, yeah. And they were kind of more flow, too. Like, Bone Crusher wasn't on the crunk yet. Yeah. Right? He came around to doing crunk. Uh -huh. He was like, Shh. Hey, I'm this about to do this crunk too. Yeah. Right, he did uh, Never Scared, but that exactly. was years later. So, so I'm realizing the artists that we have don't all the way match exactly what John does. Yeah. And I'm trying to find that, that thing that really is influenced more by yeah. John than really is like John, same type of music. So I, I, I remember I'm, I'm, I was driving across the bridge on Bankhead, just going across the highway bridge, and my phone rang, and it was Don P. I didn't know who he was. And he said, he said, people keep telling me if I could just get this music in the right hands, I, I got something. And it just sounded kind of honest the way he said, people keep telling mm -hmm. me. So I was like, let me, you know, let me have him come meet me. So he came to the office. We was in the hood. Mm -hmm. The BME office was 
you know, Harwell Street, Harwell Hustlers, <laughs> you know, Ashby and MLK mm -hmm. area. That's Joseph Lowry to y'all. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And, um, and so uh, he came over there. Like, I think I, he said he had to step past the crackheads to get to the office. <laughs> and, we, uh, and he played me some songs. He, and he, he had a song called, I'm, I'm from Decatur. I'm from Decatur. I was like, that's cool. Mm. Then, like, the third song was Get On My Level. And I was like, yo, that's, that's your song. I was like, that's your record. Go work that record and come back and see me when you got that record going. Ooh. Right? Yeah. And then this this little kid had been hanging around me a lot. They call him Stay Fresh now, but back then we called him <laughs> Lil BME. Yeah. He had been hanging around and he was high school age too. Yeah. So I was like, hey, uh, Lil BME, go catch up with them and keep exactly. an eye on them and let me know when it's popping. Yeah. So so about a couple months went by and Stay Fresh called and was like, hey, come out to this teen club. It's going down. Come out to the teen club. It's happening. And so I said, okay, I'm going to come out. And at that time, I still was like a square lawyer, like yeah. and a tie, because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to survive. So music isn't all the way there yet. I'm yeah. doing accident cases. I'm doing, you know, you know, BME was still coming along, but exactly. it wasn't there. So I come in a suit to this teen club. Yeah. Right? The bouncer looking at me like, what is, what are you, you're an adult. <laughs> What are you doing at this club? I'm like, I just came to see this artist, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I get in, and, uh, and Trillville gets on, and they do Get On My Level, and the crowd goes crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, because I got this thing. I feel like if you can make 1,500 people go crazy, that means you can make 15,000 people go crazy. X. And if you can make 15,000 people go crazy, you can make a whole nation go crazy. That's right. So they had 1,500 people going nuts in there. And I was like, okay. That's it. It's done. We're signing them. Mm -hmm. Y'all get ready to come through. Da 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 da. Um, and, you know, they told you the story about when they came back. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but before I left, I was leaning on the wall, and the and the DJ said, "Y'all know what's next." And the DJ started doing like this, <laughs> right? And I yeah. look around, and everybody in the club. I'm talking about the the bartender, the security guy, the <laughs> owner of the club. <laughs> The cute girls, everybody was like, I was like, what the heck is about to happen? <laughs> what is this? Yeah. And lo and behold, here come Lil Scrappy. He come running out, and he does head bustle. He's throwing the water, everything. Tore his shirt off. <laughs> I was like, yo, who is this kid? <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, I got to wait for him. Yeah. So I waited till he got off the stage yeah. and hollered at him. And, uh, and then him and Mama D came over a couple days later, and, you know, that was a I don't know if he told a story about that, but it, yeah. it was wild. Mama D ain't never changed. <laughs> Mama D is a real, what she is is what she is. She was that then when he was a 17, 18-year-old boy. Yeah. That's what you see on that TV now. That's Mama D still. Okay, so now BME. So we signed some acts. Exactly. Y'all yeah. got the acts. And John is going crazy by this time. Yeah, so yeah. now, what was that like for you saying, this is my childhood friend, then fucked around and talked to, turned into a hip hop icon on my ass. What was that like? You know, the funniest thing about John is like people don't get it. He's so normal, mm -hmm. you know. Like, you know, they think that really it's just gonna be what? Okay, all day, <laughs> you know. Um, but at the same time, if you remember, I told you we always kind of had a, a party nature. Yeah, That's just kind of our thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. We we as even as a crew, we just kind of just some good time dudes. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, so even as he was blowing up, we still kind of always there's a humble level to him as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so separately, we always would still get together, kick it, do what we do, and then at the same time, be managing this this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I, to be honest, I was always really impressed with the fact that you know John was one of those guys that was being an artist. Being a producer, mm. being a real label exec. Yep. Like John, I don't know if you've ever been around to hear him, like he calls out radio stations the way label execs does. Mm. So he'll be like, you know, what's up with the box in Houston? How's that looking? How we, we you know, we still, we, VEE straight? Mm -hmm. HGA, how's that, what's going on with HGA? We yep. got a, some industry, PEG in North Carolina. How is that, is, what's the numbers looking like over there? And people would be like, I never heard an artist call, and he could do it, he could do it for the whole nation. Damn. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, that's powerful right, right there. So you're looking at a guy who's being like, what? Yeah, one second, and then in the office meeting, like, 
straight what, up. Where's my goddamn money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. and and you know that to translate into this guy knows what he's talking about, so we got to make sure you get paid. Exactly. So it's almost like I'm sitting over here, like, yeah, come on, bring the money. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now. What was that tipping point for you, though, Vince, when you realized that, okay, I ain't got to do these injury claims no more. It's all music and entertainment law. Yeah, so, I mean, by the time, you know, certainly by the time, you know, Trivial and Scrappy, because we had the first deal with John, you know, but, you know, you think that first deal going to make you rich, but, yeah. you know, that first deal is, is still grow. He's still growing. We went gold, but it took a whole year for the, for the album mm. to go gold. Yeah. So by the time we were – Signing Trevor Scrap, we was going into the next deal. Mm-hmm. A little more money was starting to come, but then with with Trevor and Scrap, we got our label deal, mm. right? And with the label, you get a profit advance. Yeah, you know, you getting a profit share. Yeah, we going into a different kind of deal. Uh, we was able to get the uh, the BME offices. So now we now we not uh, we not over uh, hallway in the trap no more. We not <laughs> in the trap. You know what I mean? Like we used to literally. It used to be like they sell dope. They sell dope. Oh, but they sell, they sell music. music. <laughs> they sell music. Like, people would yeah. really be like, no, don't mess with them. They sell music. <laughs> but right here, they sell dope. And these people cutting off people from getting down the street where well, they sell dope. You know? Exactly. You know, and we was all good people on Harwell. You know, yeah. it's like all your people. But they were like, but they sell music. Exactly. So now we off of Harwell. We kind of was one of the first companies to go over to that uh, Howell Mill, mm. Call Your Road area. Yeah. So we went over there. A lot of other companies, actually, a lot of studios came over there. Mm-hmm. But uh, this was 2003. So, you know, we, we, we were one of the first to come over there. And we get, when we got that money coming in, and now we got our money we got from John's deal coming. Mm-hmm. And now we got this money coming from Warner Brothers and a profit share. Yeah. Right? And now the other things starting to happen. Now the the... the Energy drink is coming along. Mm. The Oakley Shades deal that John had came along. Yeah, um, we we kind of went back to the roots of the skateboarding stuff, and we tied back in with like Ryan Sheckler. I don't know if you remember him. He was kind of like a famous skateboarder yeah. on MTV at the time. We created like the BME Click X Game crew. Mm. Right now we all in that world. Yeah, and then uh, and then we had basically kind of discovered Pitbull. And help yin yang a lot. Yeah. So you know, with that, Pitbull is like we, the, the Latin world has kind of opened up. Mm-hmm. So now we just got multiple streams of income coming in, uh, and all that just slowly ramped up and 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 became became what it was. You know, we was, you know, Coach tell me we was QC in Atlanta then. Exactly. That's what coach said. Coach was like, what y'all did then was like QC now. Well, now we knew that. We yeah. understood that, and we knew that BME was like the biggest thing coming out of the damn city. Lil John went on to become an icon behind all of the work that y'all put together. So that's what my thought process is as a point of reference for somebody else, a group of guys coming out of Southwest Atlanta trying to figure out how they can do it. Yeah. You need a lawyer, a couple of DJs, an artist, and a manager. <laughs> and somebody got to go to school. So now, yeah. this is my thought process now. How did y'all remain humble after y'all had cracked the code and everything was at y'all feet? To be honest, I think that's just our nature. That's okay. just who we are. I think that's kind of like a Southwest Atlanta type of thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, if you know people from Atlanta and you kind of know different neighborhoods, you know, College Park people kind of got their style. Yeah, pop a lot. that's real. You know, people from the east side got a particular that's style. That's true. Right? That's Even true. the west side. Southwest Atlanta and the west side is two different things. That's true, too, You know now. what I'm saying? So, I'm with so, you. So, so, you know, the 30318 exactly. is a little different from the 30331. That's true. And so when you from southwest Atlanta, I think, you know, all those mayors have come from there. Yeah. All the, you know, Fulton County Commissioners. Preachers. When you're growing up, preachers, yep. doctors, lawyers. Yep. So you end up seeing people's parents yeah. that was big people yeah. that were normal people. Come right? on. So you're like, yeah, oh, Hank Aaron standing around the corner. Hank Aaron. That's Hank Aaron. He's a regular person. <laughs> oh, that's Andrew Young. Oh, Come he's on. a regular person. Shirley I got to Franklin. His son. Shirley Franklin. We, pl- we swimming in her pool. Come on. So when you end up becoming something out of Southwest Atlanta, if you grew up seeing these things, you're like, well, this is normal. Exactly. You know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, Dexter, I, one of my first jobs was working for Martin Luther King's son, Dexter King. Mm. When they were creating the, uh, when not creating, but doing their intellectual property management of making sure that people has, 
just stop running crazy with the King imagery without yeah. if people making money on King image, they were like, you got to pay us. Exactly. And I know people say, well, that's money to King. But why is somebody else going to make exactly. money? Exactly. And not let the family make money. Those so, are bad. you know, so that was one of my first jobs. So I'm, I'm over here watching a man that looked just like Martin Luther King. <laughs> his son looked just like him. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, and I'm watching him make his moves and figure out how he's going to protect his father's legacy. You know? What was the biggest deal that you have done, Vince, that made you shaking your boots a little bit? Or <laughs> was you always just so confident in feeling yourself the whole time? I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, I'm good at being creative with these deals, man. Yeah. You know, and you have to, it's a creativity in this too. Mm. You know, there's a talent of being talent, and then there's a talent of doing business. Those and so facts. people, you know, people, have, you know, African Americans have to do a good job of respecting the talent of business. Because, you know, a lot of other cultures respect the talent of business as much as, if not sometimes more, more. than the talent of talent. Exactly. Right? You know, so I'm with in you. the talent of business, you do have to be creative. You have to you have to push the envelope. Sometimes you have to, you know, excite the other party, you know, because you're trying to make sure they come out to, to pay you everything you want to get paid exactly. for your client. You know, uh, and in this, these days, I'm, you know, I'm pushing for things like, you know, Profit shares from the beginning. If I if I got the artist with the right kind of buzz, the right kind of excitement, the right kind of leverage, yeah. you can't do it for everybody. But yeah. when you got the right leverage, then you know we're pushing for millions, multi millions. We're mm -hmm. pushing for profit shares. We're pushing for master ownership, mm -hmm. if not reverting or, or you know these kind of things. So so these things are possible today, mm -hmm. right? The deals thanks to companies like Empire. Uh, foundation media. Some of these companies have really shaked up the the, the, the they've shaken they've shaken up the game. Even like the tune cores and uh, you know the, yeah. the, the um, um, CD babies, yeah. right? Because there's so much option that people have that when something catches or something finds its audience, you know these labels have to kind of bend more than they used to have to bend because yeah. the options. Used you to don't not need them. Used to be well, you, right. Used to be no options. Used yep. to be look if you want it to happen, you got to pick one of these companies, and we're going to give you the. We're all going to give you a certain kind of deal. Exactly. Right? Now it's like, well, you know what? Fine, I'll go over here. Or <laughs> I'll go over there. Right. I got options, and therefore, what does options do? Options give you more options. Exactly. Right. And so, and so, I, I, I'm just excited to watch the game continue to change. For artists coming up in the game right now, Vince, you have a crazy buzz. You got a fan base. You're already streaming and doing numbers. Does it even make sense to sign label deals now, or how does that uh, record deals? How does that go? Well, I mean, it kind of depends on how much financing you have, because at the end of the day, it does take a certain amount of money to get up to a certain stage in a certain place. You know, okay. I've, I've, you know, you get the occasional, and when I say occasional, I've probably seen this in 22 years. I've probably seen this three times. Okay, the occasional record that would go all the way without a budget, mm. right? So, like, uh, going all the way back, Whistle While You Twerk was a record that Ying Yang Twins did that I feel like would have gone all the way with or without a budget. Yeah. There's something about that record, mm. right? I mean, so few of these records. That's how far back I got to think to come up with one. So saying that meaning you can have a really good song, but you got to feed the machine. You yeah. got to feed that song. And you, so if you're not with a label, you do need A, financing, and B, people who know how to make that record go where it needs to go. Yeah. Right? Because it's a little bit of a puzzle. It's a little bit of a, you know, something that you have to put together the right way. If you put F before C, you might have messed up the way this project could go. Exactly. Right? So you need the right people in the circle. So in that same scenario you just told me where you got the buzz, you it's hot. It's popping. Um, do I need to sign a deal? My question. Do you have the right people around you? Because if you do, I'm, I'm going to help you not have to do it. Yeah. You know, but do you have the right kind of people around you? Do you have the right financing? Is that financing willing to pay the money it's really going to take? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, you know we, we, I've heard stories of, of you know, sh street dudes going broke, <laughs> breaking an artist. You know, yeah. Because a hit, a hit is... A gift and a curse. Mm. You got a hit. You are going to keep feeding that hit. Like you know, like, you're like if oh, if I stop now, radio's going to drop. Yeah, I got to continue to you know market this thing. I got to continue to promote this thing. 
uh, I, I uh, you know, I had to grow it now. It's, stag- it's looking stagnant. And mm-hmm. In order for it to grow to the next phase, I'm gonna have to put a few more dollars in. Yeah. So I got money coming in from this record, but I'm pretty much gonna put every dollar that comes in back out, mm. which was how it was for us. We were independent. So, yeah. You know, we were independent. You know, it's funny because nowadays, you get a, he- a record as good as who you with. You can't even move five feet before they're gonna give you a record deal. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. But back then they didn't give deals to street music from Atlanta. Damn. Right? Yeah. So we had Who You With, as big as it was, regional record. Yeah. Spending our money. No label came. Then we had Shotty Freak a Little Song, what produced by Tune with Jazzy Faye on the hook. Yeah. You don't even know that. Big record. No deal. Then we had the couldn't be a better player than me, right? Ooh, with two short, two short, yeah, right. With the with the with that eight oh eight that was busting the speakers in the clubs. My God, right? Owners would be like, "Don't play that song." <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "Don't play that song," but you know the song was huge. Yeah, no deal. Then we did. I like them girls. This is a span of five years, so we really had to learn. But it was a blessing because we learned how to be a label. See, artists don't get a chance to learn to be a label now. Yeah. Because they they sign them so fast, mm-hmm. but we and we would have took a deal if they would have come. Exactly, they, just didn't, they were like, we don't believe in it. Like you know, Outkast was more hip hop, like real yeah. hip hop. You know, so they would give uh, actual hip hop mm-hmm. deals in Atlanta, but artists like you know Kilo Ali, yeah, Raheem the Dream. These yeah. artists went most of their career, or their whole career, with no deal. Yeah, Kizzy Rock. Yeah, um, who else from back in the base days? Um, Smurf. Smurf. Yeah. Exactly. You know, Smurf had to turn around and become Kali Park <laughs> yeah. and sign an artist. You know what I mean? <laughs> but Smurf as an artist did not get a deal, right? Yeah. So, so but, but once we get, once we went gold, after we had been independent all those years, after I liked them girls, we had Bia Bia. Mm-hmm. And Bia Bia was when the deal came. Yeah. And then, even then, it still was with a, a small company, TVT. Yeah. So, when, when we went gold after uh, one year, Every label said, oh, we, you can go go with that kind of music? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I remember they called me. They wanted Baby D. They were like, you, can you hook me up with Big Oom? <laughs> I'm like, Big Oom, office around the corner from my office. I can walk over there. We exactly. Was back then, me and Oom would just, i walk over there. You know, he'll probably drive over to my office. Yeah. Walk. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll come over, and we'll just talk about how we're going to try to make this thing happen. Yeah. You know, he had all the Oom stores going and everything like that. So... But um, but it was a grind, and being independent costs. And so you know how much how 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 strong are you and willing to keep going like that? It's gonna be the question. What were the bumps? And in then the, what kind of offers the deals going? The label gonna give you. Now break that down too. The, I mean, the label might. I mean, if you at that point of strength, I can we can get a label to give you a deal that is the right deal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Where you are a proper profit share partner. Where you are a proper you know co-owner or owner of the masters, mm-hmm. uh, you know, these kind of things. But that's when you've de- got that level of buzz, mm-hmm. you know. So when you think about what what, uh, what Coach and P did with Migos by the time they had really done it with yeah. the Versace record. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, you're completely independent with a record like Versace or something like that. You walking in that, exactly. you know, you're going to give me the deal I want. So now when it comes time to negotiating those deals and going in there, how do you go about negotiating them, Vance? I mean, is it all about leverage or is it, can you uh, pull a rabbit out of a hat in I that might, thing? I, I might, mean, break that I down. I just might. I mean, so, you know, leverage, number one, most important thing. Number two, a lot of times these lawyers, they know me, mm. right? A lot of times these executives also know that I've been consistently having something hot for 20 years yeah so if you want to stay in my good side because even if this is not the one that you really want to spend that much money on <laughs> but that next one he got might be yeah right then maybe you should do be right by this one yeah maybe you should do a little bit better deal than you wanted to do for this one mm-hmm. so that you can be properly in line for the right deal to, for the next one that comes along exactly you know that's that's I mean, that, that, that's business, right? Yeah. That's business in general. That's smart business. Mm-hmm. So the smart attorneys and the smart label execs say, do that for Vince. Mm-hmm. You know, it's Vince. Do that. I know, it's a, I know that's much, but do that for Vince. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's what you want. 
how do you how can you tell who's going to be successful and who's not going to be successful? What do you think that it is that people have that makes you say, okay, I'm going to help you out or I'm going to work with you? I mean, first of all, there's an it that just is, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know. I used to always say Crime Mob was the genuine article. There was a thing about them when they came in a room. You know, we was doing street music and it was hood and everything, but when they came in, you knew. Like, there was, a, there was something going on with these guys. <laughs> you know, there was an it when they came in. But, I mean, I just said that recently about a girl, uh, a, a new artist. I looked at some videos, and it was just watch her talk and watch her be. Mm-hmm. And I said, she's got that it factor. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's one thing, the it factor. But it factor can be lazy. So it's a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. It's a couple of yeah. other ingredients that's going to be necessary. Yeah. Because nobody's going. Nobody can carry you out and on their shoulders and make you into a star. Yeah. Unless maybe you like one of those groups that they put together, mm-hmm. you know, on a rare occasion, like and, and they never getting paid right because they got put together. Yeah. You know, but but you know, but if you are a person that is driven to be a recording artist, a celebrity, a superstar, actor, mm-hmm. anything in this entertainment space. You gotta, you, yeah, you have to have that it factor, but you cannot be lazy because I say, I say getting people to listen to your music is like running for president. Yeah, it's yeah. like running for office. Imagine somebody trying to get somebody else to do all their campaigning for them. Mm-hmm. Kissing the babies and shaking hands. If, if, the, if the candidate doesn't do it, the candidate is not gonna win. Mm. So people who think they can make this amazingly hot music because that's the other factor, right? The music has to be right. Or the talent has to be right. The skill has to be right. The ick factor, the work ethic, the skill, the talent. But all those things have to come together, right? So you can, you can actually uh, be a person that makes this amazing music, but just don't like to come out of the studio. Yeah. You want to just slide it under the door and think somebody's going to slide you a plaque back. <laughs> <laughs> you think they're going to slide you a gold, silver, a uh, platinum plaque back. It's not going to happen, you know? If, if that's you, you know what you should do? You should be a writer. Yeah. You should be like, I write these amazing records. Let me find somebody to, who is a grinder yeah. to perform them. And there's nothing wrong with that, to be honest, because the grinder might not have the writing talent. Thanks. Might not have that skill. Exactly. You know, people have to recognize what is their particular skill and then work that, you know? So if, you, if you're more like, I'm completely shy and I don't like to come out and I almost don't want to perform these songs. Yeah. But they such good records, and I think it's, you know what? Let somebody record those records who's gonna run around every night, get in people's faces, talk to the DJs, post every day on their Instagram. Because now, used to be, in our in the earlier days, it was like, just be in the streets every day. Exactly. Now it's like, you better be posting on, on the internet TikTok. every day. You better yeah. be posting on, and in the streets. Yeah. To me, to me. I'm with you. You know, because because if you are a purely TikTok based, if you will, for your celebrity, then one of these days that TikTok is not going to be there, and you need a other base, a real human base to, exactly. to mess with your music. And I feel like people in and um, especially in Atlanta, these DJs, they you know they're so special. They really break records. You know, yeah. they 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 all superstars. Exactly. But but you know what? They're important. They finally they have figured out we are important to this game. Exactly. And and so we are going to support those who come through and see us and talk to us and spend time with us and who know us and we and who we know. So yeah, you you need to be all day, all night at the club, all day on your social media. And then, you know, work your nine to five too because you still gotta eat. Exactly. Nobody's just gonna give you, you know, it's it's a grind. You have to be that special thing. Was there ever a time in your career, Vince, that stuff was getting too real and you was thinking to yourself, I don't know why I signed up for this shit? Uh yeah. And what yeah. was that time and how yeah. did you break so out of it? We're not gonna get too deep into yeah. it, but you know, sometimes these artists are engaged in some wild life. Woo! Some wild yeah. life, some dangerous life. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm kind of like one for it because I'm from Atlanta. Yeah. I'm, you know, before we, before we moved out of town, I live. I'm from Ashby MLK area yeah. myself, right? So I'm yeah. from Atlanta. I got, you know, been hanging in all kinds of neighborhoods my whole life, so I understand. Yeah. Right, and probably to be honest, even when I was younger, it probably just didn't bother me as much. Exactly. You know what I mean? But now that I'm pushing fifty, yeah. I'm like, gotta, you know, it's time to be grown man about it. And so just to, 
it's just you see things differently when you get a little older, you know? Yeah. And so sometimes it's the same kind of situation that I used to be like, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Now I'm like, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> you know, I'm gonna step out of this. You know, I'm gonna move on, move away. Cause, uh, yeah, cause, cause I, I ain't trying to die. Cause I ain't trying to die. <laughs> <laughs> what you you know, right, <laughs> right. I've seen things happen by mistake. Yeah, you know, exactly. In my life, you know what I mean. So, what was the number that you saw that made you say, "My God, we getting this for this"? Um, let's see. I think it, it got to where we would be able to say, like, like it, it got to a point where the money was just flowing and we could just say no a lot, right? Ooh. And once you start really saying no, people start raising their dollar to get you to say yes. My God. And, you know, without being too specific, I, I, I remember a moment where it was like, you know, damn, it's a couple million dollars to do something really small. <laughs> You know, and it's like, wow, because you because, you know, no, no long enough. And there's value in it, you know, but it doesn't take but so much time or actual effort from the person. Yeah. You know, especially now when you can just, um, you know, even today, you can imagine when someone can make a post. Yeah. It doesn't take much time at all. Yeah. Right. Or someone could do, uh, you know, just kind of endorse something, mm -hmm. you know, and you can you can get millions of dollars for this when they realize that you that that you carry enough weight and enough people pay attention to you and that that uh, there's an audience that, you know, that identifies with you. Mm -hmm. and, if the, and, the, and that audience, you know, is likely to engage in something that you suggest to them, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's valuable. What are some bad business practices that you see people engage in that cause them to be unsuccessful? Uh, the number one, I would say, is not paying their team. Mm. You know, uh, anybody I've seen that had that reputation of not paying their team has been the the ones that didn't go far yeah. because the reality is nobody is a successful individual by themselves. Yeah. Everybody in this game that has been successful is that because there's a group of people because it's only so much any one person can do, period. Mm -hmm. Right. And especially if you're going to be the talent, the artist, the character, then how can you do that and then turn around and say, OK, now let me handle this and do that and, and then turn around and do, you know, yeah. it's tough. So people who don't pay their team lose that team, mm -hmm. or the team stays with them, but they, they, ain't know, doing they, don't, shit. they don't do much work because they're like, I'm not getting paid from this, so I'll get around to that because I got I to gotta gotta make money. I got to work for the things that's going to pay me, that's so right. those things keep jumping in front. So you have you know, that issue. Mm -hmm. You also have people that are uh, creatives that either like sign stuff without a lawyer reading it. Mm -hmm. That's probably you know the the biggest mistake because you, you end up cutting your legs off before you can even find out that you should have paid your team because <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's, you did that in the beginning, mm -hmm. you signed something with somebody who d has no idea what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Atlanta, because the music industry is so big and because the film and TV industries have come here, mm -hmm. you have a lot of people here who also are kind of what I call the razzle dazzles, right? They mm -hmm. kind of, you know, trying to sell people a dream who exactly. really can't even help them. Right. And so, seen it. you know, and so you got people that either one have paid these people a bunch of money. Yeah. Or two have signed something with these people without having uh, a contract looked over. So those things, you know, big, big no no's, period. You know, oh God. Yeah. So now back to the BME, what was it that caused y'all to dissolve it and go y'all separate ways? So when. We, we, were, we were in a renegotiation with Warner Brothers at a particular time. Mm -hmm. And it was some things going on in business that, in particular, John was like, I don't really like the way this is going. Mm -hmm. And we're hot. Mm. Like, I, like I just said, Coach said, y'all were like QC at the time. Yeah. Right? So we ended up deciding we were going to break off that negotiation and, you know, go, you know, go take our, 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 us as a company out and talk to some other labels. We're going to go see where we're going to go with it. Mm -hmm. Well, around that same time, as happened, chance would happen, the music industry was going into a complete crash. Mm. The Napster issue. Yeah. Right? So it was the worst time to be the high ticket item. Like, we was the most expensive thing around. Shit. We were the high ticket <laughs> item at a time that the labels were like, we don't even know how we're going to 
keep our doors open. Yeah. Right? They hadn't even, they, they had not come up with the, even the 360 idea yet. Yeah. They were like, we're spending the money, but nobody's buying music anymore. Everybody's sharing it for free. Mm-hmm. Right? And so it, it, it was a, just the worst time to be in that position. Saying, yeah, but here we are, the guys that just broke Trivia, Scrappy Crime Mob, did those couple of albums with E-40, had the Bo Hague and stuff yeah. going. You know, we was like, yeah, you're going to pay us a top, top dollar to bring this machine over there. Yeah. But it was just like, like it was kind of like uh, if you were selling $1,000 jeans at the same time that the market crashed. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> at that moment, people were like, I'm not buying $1,000 exactly. jeans right now. When the, housing trying to bubble, put some pants on. when the when the housing bubble happened, right? <laughs> yep. You know, we were we were the thousand dollar jeans at the at the moment where the whole music industry was like, we we are on, we might be done. This this might be over. You know, my God, yeah. So that that just was what it was for that period of time, mm-hmm. which really caused everybody to really try to figure out, okay, what's our own personal next play? Mm-hmm. If the BME thing can't be, you know, yep. what we think it should be and we're not gonna undersell ourselves, we're not gonna go out here and and, and sell ourselves off of pennies. Yeah. Uh, and so John, you know, really started committing himself then to, you know, it became just John. Mm-hmm. It wasn't so much John and the East Side Boys. And he started committing himself to uh I think at that time he kinda of was going into the rock stuff. Yeah. More the rock stuff and then ultimately EDM. So he was kind of figuring out what his next play Exit was. Exit strategy. You know, mm-hmm. just the next play. Really, yeah. because John is not a look back kind of person. He's yeah. really a what's next kind of person. Mm-hmm. Whether it was DJing reggae, DJing house, mm-hmm. DJing bass music, you know, crunk creating crunk, on and on. Yeah. You know, so for me it was the fallback. <laughs> ah, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> Don't forget. Come on now, I'm with you. I'm with, you. On I'm with you, you. know what I mean? And so, uh, and, and I, I had really always been thinking about, man, look at all those clients that you let go Shit. when BME took off. Because yeah. when the label took off, I was like, hey, Jeezy, hey, you know, Pastor, you, you know, people who I, I was like, this thing is taking off now. This Damn. is what I've been working on. I'm gonna kinda, you know, I should have been like, let me just try to keep them as clients, exactly. but it was like, oh, it was no, a lot. this is what I want to do, and I'm running this label now. Mm-hmm. So now I hadn't been practicing for some time, you know? So then I had to go back and start getting new clients and that kind of thing, which was a rebuild because people at that time did not know that Vince discovered Scrappy or Trillville. Or yeah. Because it didn't, that wasn't a sexy story. So the story <laughs> was Lil John discovered him. That, you know, that was kind of my, I, I pushed that out there because mm-hmm. I thought, I always wanted it to be the right thing that made people be interested. Exactly. And it sounded better to me. I think it would sound better to anybody to say that Lil John went and found these artists. Exactly. Than to say, yeah, law, the lawyer from the crew. <laughs> he the one found with the super artists. That don't make sense, exactly. you know? Just don't, you know. So now I'm realizing, damn, but without that reputation, you know, I don't have the value. The of leverage so going back out of what yeah. I did. Nobody knows, so now yeah. I'm out here kind of like, you know, trying to toot my horn and stuff, <laughs> you know. But ultimately, I think um, I think I got with Kevin Gates was one of the first of the next big wave for me, and so yeah. I started repping Kevin, and I kind of approached it in a way, the same way that I do, I couldn't help it. I couldn't help but have like a, my BME mind. Yeah. So I'm coming to him and Breadwinners Association and Drika, and I'm, and I'm giving them paperwork advice, but also like, how do you succeed, advice? Yeah, you know, yeah. and then that just continued on into the other clients on up. So now, you know, we got the kids, bottom got them, and yeah. uh, uh, Mooski, and yeah. those are the most recent deals, you know, and uh, um, and so it's still more like I want to give that additional kind of advice about how to truly succeed as men, women in this business, um, and, and, and as creatives. And then ultimately have a career beyond, you know. When you see folks like NBA Youngboy look up and have the most streamed music on YouTube all together, what goes through your mind at those times when you're thinking, you just came in here, now you're the biggest thing in hip hop? Yeah, no, it's uh, for me, like I mentioned, I saw the work ethic mm. and I saw how much he made the videos and things of that nature, you know. Um, so, and it made sense because the narrative is compelling. Mm. People are interested in him. Yeah. Right? And, it, and it makes sense because he is what they call an enigma. Yep. He is an interesting person, mm-hmm. you know? And so now 
just that natural draw mixed with that work ethic, mm -hmm. mixed with shooting four or five videos mm -hmm. in a week, mixed with having kind of taught his audience where to find him. Yeah. Right? Some people teach their audience to find them on um, SoundCloud. Mm -hmm. Some people have taught their audience to find them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I'm on Instagram. I promote Instagram. Yeah. Some people are really t t now teaching their audience to find them on TikTok. Mm -hmm. But he has always taught his audience, I'm on YouTube. Where the money is at? Where the money resides? <laughs> yeah, the money resides. <laughs> you know, where the money resides? But you know what? I'm, I'm going to tell you. That now, you get the, the more streams on Spotify does make more money than more Ooh. streams on YouTube. Yeah. But I feel like that YouTube kind of thing also blows up your personality Yeah, the more. visuals. It gives you more opportunity to create the other streams of income that might come yep. from the visual because of the visual. Yeah. When it comes to diversifying that portfolio, the money's coming in and now you're trying to diversify. What are some of the things that people need to be looking into as far as, okay, I understand that this music is making me this money. How do I go about getting money from these other situations? So, you know, I feel like, first of all, that's when it comes down to having a good wealth manager. Mm. A good, you know, at this point, you should have had a, a good accountant, a good business manager, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And within that circle should be a wealth manager. Mm -hmm. And they should be someone who is able to show you things that meet your risk, your risk uh, level. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, you, you, we're seeing it all the time right now, especially in technology, mm -hmm. when we're seeing people like Nas, um, 2 chains, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, Rick Ross. With the with the chain of, of uh, chicken, uh, yeah, wing stops, wing yeah. stops, right? These things are like, I just love it. I love yeah. it because it's like the that's the diversity that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then also, I feel like people need to also remember to add a charity aspect, be a part of you know some good things. I, you know, I, I think I told you I work with a like Youth Spark, yeah, right. I'm working with Youth Spark, and I'm working with that, that really is attacking. Um, it's, it's essentially, Youth Spark started as attacking the child sex trafficking. Yeah. Right? First. But has really expanded. We've expanded the mission for really any time that adults are taking advantage of, ch of youth, of, ch mm -hmm. of children. But, but child sex, sex trafficking is still the main cornerstone of Youth Spark. So, you know, we, I'm, you, you know people like myself, I'm engaged in, on the board for Youth Spark. Mm -hmm. Or... Um, during the protests, we sent, you know, I sent thousands of boxes of mm. food to Louisville, Kentucky, mm. just to support, you know, they had, the, the grocery store had burned down Damn. during the protests. Yeah. Right? People kind of like, oh, well, y'all burned down your grocery store. Now you got no groceries, right? <laughs> so now they got, a, they got a grocery desert. Yeah. And now at that time, they were having Occupy, Louisville, Occupy, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so... I, you know, they were looking for lawyers to support, but I, I can't rep people in Kentucky because I'm not a Kentucky attorney. I don't have a bar number in Kentucky. So, mm -hmm. so my, myself and a guy, Latron Price, we, um, you know, we, we, we put 500 boxes a week for several weeks on a truck mm -hmm. of produce mm. and sent it up there. And they gave it to the community. You know, they, they had money, food for themselves and also food for the community up there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that you got to be willing to give also when you're talking about all the ways that you can get, all the ways you can diversify to receive. Mm -hmm. You also got to remember to be a giver, too, because I think that helps open up. I know it op helps open up those opportunities. You know? Exactly. When you look at yourself as a successful lawyer in the game, though, Vince, how do we go about reaching the community and letting other young black men and women know that this is a viable option for you in the future and this is something that you want to look into? And how do we let them know that, you know, because sometimes folks just might think it's too hard. I ain't got time to be sitting in law school all this time. I don't feel like criminal justice. I don't feel like. Right. Tell them the outcome versus the, the income and the outcome at the same time. I mean, it's. Is, well, number one, that's why I'm, that's one of the reasons I'm here, right? One Thank of the you. reasons is to you know you got the you got the rappers on here, yeah, and that's great, and a lot of people want to do that, but somebody like me needs to be on here too to say exactly other options for you know I'm from Atlanta, I'm from the neighborhood, exactly. I went to Georgia State University, 
at a time where you know, and it's still not a real, not an expensive school. Georgia State yeah. is. A, I don't really want to hear anybody say they can't afford to go to college. Yeah. Like that's I that's feel out. That. Like I you feel can't that. tell me you can't you can't. If afford you can afford to, to, to put college. some clothes on your back, you can, you can pretty to much to afford to go to college, exactly. especially with all the programs that they have. So exactly. number one, that's number one, mm-hmm. right? And so you know, I went to Georgia State, went to John Marshall Law School, <clears throat> which at the time was a lesser expensive law school. It's more mm. expensive now, but you know, it was a lesser expensive law school. It's doable. Yeah. You know, it was doable. And I stayed in town so that I could stay close yeah. because I saw, again, I saw this thing happening. I saw, you know, oh, look, Jermaine Dupree just came up in a beat up Cherokee. Two months later, he driving a brand new Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? I was like, I'm not leaving because something will take off exactly. without me. So I was like, I'm gonna stay right here in this town. Yeah, keep on being amongst my people. Yeah, be the lawyer-ish guy in the circle, right? Yeah. While I'm becoming a lawyer. Yeah, start being that. Start exactly. acting like that. Start thinking like that. You know, start watching and protecting your friends and their money. Get associated with other lawyers. Mm-hmm. You know, or, or with people that work in law offices. Um, you know, because when we first came into this, when I first finished law school, uh-huh. I remember my mom saying, I said I wanted to, to do entertainment law. And she said, is there enough of that in Atlanta? It really didn't exist like Damn. that. Damn. They were like, is it enough to even make a living? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, my friends are doing it. So I'm going to be working with them, you know. Um, but now, fast forward now, you know, like I said, after, after John went gold, you know, the, 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 the walls came tumbling exactly. down. We opened up the doors for a lot of deals yeah. at that point for street music. You yeah. know, a lot of the Atlanta real street music started getting deals after that. Mm-hmm. And as it opened up, and this Atlanta swag got to the world. Yeah. You know. <laughs> That's real. You know, before that, New York and L.A. owned hip hop. But mm-hmm. once they got a taste of what Atlanta was really doing with this hip hop. Exactly. You see what happened. Right. When it comes to people like Jeezy and John, BME and CTE, they had real movements, like yeah. grassroots movements that you could feel them in the street. The music, yeah. you was riding down the street and you heard yourself coming Absolutely. down the street. Absolutely. What was going through your mind at that time? And what do you think caused those situations to be so phenomenal? Because we were of the people. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people in the industry concentrate on um, playing to the industry. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you, you would hear people say, I got this name producer. I got this name feature. I got this name situation going on. I got this kind of, you know, endorsement from you know, within the industry. Mm-hmm. But for John and the East Side Boys, for uh, Jeezy, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Toon, a lot of the people, uh, Toon with T.I., um, you know, the music was more speaking to the people mm-hmm. than, worrying, than worrying about what the music industry higher up, so the, the names felt. And I always say, if you, if you, <clears throat> if the people... If the people are with you, you're good. Mm-hmm. Regardless, that is your that is your blessing. So, you know, being of the people, being out there, being a part of it. John was a person that sold that party on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. He showed up. He was at the club. He would stay until the lights came on every time. Mm. Right? It's kind of a joke because he still does it. It's like a long running joke in our crew. Yeah. Like if you go, don't ride with John. Don't ride with John because <laughs> he's not gonna leave, night. and you're gonna be drunk as heck and now that we all getting older i can't believe like john still goes he still goes yeah. he still does it you know but then you got jeezy and his movement and what was going on with that movement and how it was in the club like you know he was in magic city it was like the story he was telling you saw it mm-hmm. and the people were like and, and he was really selling like motivational street music yeah like you go back and listen to it it really was a motivational aspect to it um you know you look at ti and same thing, you know. He was more like I'm. I'm of the bankhead guy standing on the on the corner that would just throw some dope over there, yeah. <laughs> trying to get. You know, people felt like he was of them. Exactly. So I think these kind of things are the, are what makes um, that would makes the movements. 
monetizing your brand. How do you go about helping these people to monetize their brand? Because a lot of times, folks have a strong brand, yep. but don't know how to monetize it. They don't know how to go get sponsorships and endorsements and stuff like that. Right. They just sit over there with this brand going crazy, wondering right. what am I supposed to do next? Well, like I mentioned earlier, you got different brands that match for different people. So when Snoop or Wiz Khalifa do a brand, it should be rolling papers. It should be a strand, right? Yeah. That's what their brand is. When John mm. does something, it should be alcohol or an energy drink. When somebody, you know, you know what I mean? Things mm -hmm. are doing things that match what they're talking about. So now you got this number of people that recognize you for that thing. How do we monetize it, right? Mm -hmm. You dress, you're known for clothes. You're yeah. like ASAP Rocky. He's known for being in fashion. Mm -hmm. How do you monetize it? Because now people know that about you. That's right. There's different ways to do it. You know, obviously, if you have the right team, the team is out here searching for the right thing. Mm -hmm. But also you can, you can, you know, uh, artists can kind of raise a flag they can they can kind of mention something in a way and hashtag that thing or add that that mm -hmm. particular thing. You let a company because now every company has a head of of digital marketing. Mm. Every company has that. I, yeah. There's a girl that worked for us named Jasmine that used to um, do when I did I did we are separate from BME I did we are tunes mm -hmm. the Nene I did that like on my own as an independent yeah right and so during that time I had Jasmine work with me and she was like um, going to school for digital marketing that was a major yeah and i was like what kind of major is that i never heard of that major mm -hmm. but now she's got a job in that space and now i see that every company has that no, like it's when imperative wendy's, now when wendy's or or, or what, what some of those food chains were going at yeah. each other on yeah, twitter, on twitter yeah. i was like oh okay i see what's going <laughs> exactly. on exactly we got real actual people who so when those people see a celebrity say i drink this water they're like going to action they're yeah. going to contact you. They're exactly. going to contact somebody. What you know? I mean, the world is big and the world is small. It's That's getting right. smaller and smaller. You can talk to anybody, mm -hmm. you know, because there's so many ways. Somebody tried to call me through my Facebook the other day. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm like, darn, you don't have my. They don't have my number. They don't have my Instagram. They try to call me through Facebook messages. Yeah. I said, man, you can't escape. Yeah, this a buzz. <laughs> <laughs> so I say that, but at the same time, they can reach me. They try it. Yeah, they get exactly. to me. They putting their face out there. Uh, and so the same thing, you got to have, you know, you had to have that, like that push, you got to mm -hmm. have that belief, like I can get to these people. And if that thing matches, and you can genuinely say, yeah, this matches and people, people believe in me when I say I use this microphone. Yeah. So microphone, y'all need to holler at me before I start saying I use a different microphone. Come on now. <laughs> Lastly, I got to ask you about that law school. How difficult was law school for you? I mean, you know, it's going to be different for different people. Uh -huh. now, for me. <laughs> It was a breeze. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know, honestly, it was a weird thing because when I went to law school, I was like the guy that didn't fit in. Mm. Uh, you know, back then I used to still probably smoke. I didn't know I was coming in class smelling like that. You know what I mean? And these white people used to look at me like, uh, you know, they didn't want to study with me. They yeah. didn't want me to be in their study groups. Damn. I was not, um, you know, I, I, I had to kind of just find my own little crew. Exactly. Actually, I did. Actually, I found some some good people, some good yeah. lifelong friends in law school. That's good. But, you know, I would say that it happened the way it was supposed to because, mm -hmm. crazy enough, some of those same people that were, like, not letting me around didn't even pass the bar. Mm. Right? And, <laughs> I, and no lie, I will say this. The, I, and it was supposedly, at that time, the hardest bar. Like, they, they were like, oh, we've made it harder this year, and we've added a, another element to the bar, and it was supposed to be. I was like, God, dog, why would my bar be the one? And <laughs> after two days, after the bar, after the two days of the test, I was like, oh, not so bad. Yeah. And the guy tried to fight me because I said not so bad, so he must have really thought it was bad. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you just, you know, you're blessed. Exactly. You know? yeah. Lastly, how can these folks contact you, and is there anything you want to leave them with? Uh, yeah, I would say, uh, okay, so you contact me, you know, my Instagram is uh, Vince Phillips, E-S-Q, V-I-N-C-E-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S, E-S-Q. Um, and that's, you know, I, I, I check those DMs. That's become like a, a, a good way to kind of get the first contact because I don't really want to flood my emails. Yeah. You know, if I give my email, it kind of floods out the things that I need to be that dealing you need to with. be seeing, yeah. Yeah, it makes me like can't miss something. Yeah. Um, so, so I say, you know, hit me on the direct message. I will mm -hmm. hit people back. Uh, I will contact them. Uh, and then, uh, and my thing is, you know, 
there's another, everyone has an opportunity to make it. Mm -hmm. If you're in music and you're trying to get it, you are one hit away. We are all one hit away from superstardom. I'm one hit away from superstardom right My now. God. Right? Yeah. You're a one hit song away from superstardom. I'm just not making music. Yeah. But if you're making music, you got a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, you just find the right record and find the right team and be on your proper grind. Mm -hmm. And there's an opportunity for you to make it. And, and you know, we're here to support you. We're here to help make it happen. Yes, sir. Well, Vince, appreciate right. you coming through this thing, boss. Thank you for having Wish me. Wish you nothing but the best and much success. Behind Radio Shout, Vince Phillips. We out of here. Holla. <laughs>